Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to Eagle Brook Church. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online, wherever you are taking this in from. Before we dive in, last week, Bob and Jason gave the message together. Uh, they celebrated what God has done in this church. They talked about the future that God has in store for us, kind of the vision of where we think God is taking us. And I, I don't know about you, but as I sat there and took it all in, I was filled with so much gratitude and excitement. And so if you missed that message, uh, make sure you go back and watch it May 18th and 19th because God has an exciting future ahead for us. And when you take that message in, ask God how you can play a role in the future vision that God has laid out for us. But today we're in the final week of a series titled, Hey God, I Have a Question. And each week of this series, we've tried to answer the most common objections to Christianity. Today's question why should I follow Jesus when I don't like other Christians is perhaps the most tension-filled. Why? Because let's be honest, as Christians, we don't always represent Jesus well. In his book, Unchristian, author and researcher David Kinnaman surveyed people outside of the Christian faith. Two of the primary words used to describe Christians by non-Christians, it's these two words, hypocritical and judgmental. And when I read that, I was bummed. However, I know some Christians who deserve to be labeled this way. Now, is this perception of all Christians always fair? Absolutely not. I can barely watch the news or television because of how unfairly Christianity is portrayed at times. Plus, it seems like only the wacky ones grab the headlines. Plus, a non-Christian's worldview it isn't always going to align with a Christian's belief system. And when that happens, people tend to scream hypocrisy and intolerance, regardless whether we feel like it's fair, true, or right. The reality is one of the most common objections to Jesus are hypocritical and judgmental Christians. So right out of the gate, I wanna address two separate groups of people. To the first group, to those who are skeptical of God because of other Christians, to those who have been hurt or wounded by the hypocrisy and judgment of these same people, let me just say, I'm sorry. I really am. Honestly, I've probably been that hypocritical and judgmental Christian at times. So I hope you'll give Jesus another chance. But to the second group, those who follow Christ and consider themselves a Christian, let's not start defensive. Let's just admit that we can always do better. We can work to create a welcoming, non-judgmental space for people to follow Jesus. Several years ago, you know, I, I joined a, a small gym in, in White Bear Lake that focuses on community and working out together. It's full of people committed to consistent and intense exercise. Because of that, they don't let you quit easily or anonymously. <laughs> But somehow, I've joined and quit this gym a couple of times. That's not easy to quit that many times, so I'm kind of proud of myself. <laughs> but a couple of months ago, I got the itch to rejoin this gym again, even though I'd been away for over a year, and immediately the questions started swirling. What are they gonna think of me? Will all those strong, fit people be all judgy towards my skinny-legged, flabby belly self? But nevertheless, I rejoined, and the first day back, I met a new instructor named Jess. Now, Jess is five foot two, a ball of fire and energy, and has more muscle in her pinky finger than I have my entire body. But the first day back, I met Jess, and, and she said, I've heard about you. <laughs> I said, oh, really? She said, yeah, the owner told me you're a pastor, and I need to keep it clean around you. I thought, oh, great. I try to keep that a secret for a while before people get weird around me. But she said, I also know that you joined and quit a few times. And I thought, oh boy, here it comes. The pep talk, the judgment, the how dare you come into my gym looking like that. Instead, Jess gave me the most welcoming smile and said in the most genuine way possible, welcome back. I'm so glad you're here. And since then, I've watched as, as Jess has created this motivational, non-judgmental place for people in all levels of fitness to work out. Sure, some look like they should be on the cover of men's and women's health magazines, but others are just getting started. They don't know how to do burpees, 
hang cleans, box jumps, even one pull up. But no matter people's background and experience, every person feels like they belong. No one feels like an outsider. And you know, I couldn't help but think, what if every single person who came into our church or who met another Christian felt exactly the same way? So a couple weeks ago, I got to talking to Jess about how she's able to create this kind of environment, and I wondered out loud with her whether she thought churches could do the same. As we got to talking, I learned that Jess has gone through some difficult life stuff over the last several years. And she's been to church here and there, but hasn't been in a really long time. So I invited her to join my wife Emily and I for Easter services at Eagle Brook. Partly, I said, I wanted her to evaluate just how welcome she actually felt. And she took me up on the offer and then invited a friend with her that actually had never been to a church like ours. Well, I let a week go by after Easter was over before I followed up with her because, of course, I wanted to know what her experience was like. But before I asked her what she thought, I first asked her this question. You know, Jess, why did you stop attending church in the first place? And she told me, one, because of the way I was treated by some people after my divorce. But two, she said, I know a lot of people who say they attend church on Sunday but Monday through Saturday, they're some of the most cold and judgmental people I know. And she admitted it's not fair to stereotype all Christians that way, but that was her honest assessment. And I knew that was a lot to overcome, so finally I followed up and said, well, what'd you think of your experience at Eagle Brook? And this is what she told me. She said it was bliss, honestly, from the moment we parked. The guy directing traffic gave me a high five and told me to have an awesome service. I loved the music, she said. I really loved how Pastor Bob broke down scripture to real life. I loved, she said, that I could attend and there was zero pressure for me to do anything but show up and take it all in. Man, when we heard this was her experience, Emily and I were so grateful Eagle Brook, we are really good at making people feel welcomed and accepted. Not perfect, not by any means, but really good. And although we all slip from time to time, this church is known for being a non judgmental, high integrity place where what you see is what you get. Now, what do you see? Certainly not people pretending to be perfect. Not from Bob. Have you heard him tell stories? Not from Jason, not from myself, any of our campus pastors. I don't know many regular attenders who would tell you that, you're, that they're perfect and holier than thou either. See, what you see are people who admit that they don't have all the answers. People doing their very best to follow Jesus, but they'll tell you when they screw up along the way. And when you live like that, it's virtually impossible to get labeled as hypocritical and judgmental. But even still, the hard reality is, no matter how hard we try to create a non-judgmental, hypocrisy-free church, there are still many people who refuse to follow Christ because of other Christians. And that pains me, because sometimes I'm that Christian. I've made it my life mission to, to reach those people who are far from God. I'm telling you, I've read all the books about why people are leaving the church. I've studied all the national surveys. I've evaluated all the cultural trends. I've had dozens of conversations. And essentially, people are concluding essentially the same thing. See, people don't follow Jesus because of Jesus. People don't follow Jesus because of Christians. So what can we do better to help other people follow Christ. Let me offer three ways that we can all do this together. The first is we can embrace the mess. You know, sometimes I think we separate people into categories of good and bad, righteous and unrighteous, uh, no cuss, no drinking, drive through difference, KTIS Christians, or frankly, heathens. You know, people who have an Eagle Brook bumper sticker or Satan worshipers. Just kidding. Put together are kind of a mess. And the temptation for every person, including me, 
is to keep your distance from the other side or the mess. Now, why would we do that? I mean, let's be honest, sometimes we don't have a lot in common, or maybe we don't have the time or the energy to deal with the mess of another person's life. Plus, there are times when the right thing to do is to keep your distance, especially when your own life is fragile and the mess of another person might destroy what you're trying to grow and build in your own character. But no matter the reason, see, here's what happens when people feel our avoidance. When people feel our avoidance, that's when we get labeled as cold and judgmental. Interestingly enough, Jesus often went out of his way to embrace people who were the textbook definition of mess. Prostitutes, cheaters, drunks, people considered unworthy, unclean, people who were on the outside. In fact, one of Jesus' 12 closest disciples and friends was a man named Levi, a tax collector who, who later became known as Matthew. Now, no one liked tax collectors. Everyone avoided them. But not only did Jesus make uh, Matthew one of his closest disciples and friends, look what Mark writes here. He says, Levi, Matthew, invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other, other disreputable sinners. And then notice this remark. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. Now, this is Mark's parenthetical comment. Why would he include that? To show just how many imperfect, messy, sinful people wanted to be around Jesus. I love what Pastor Andy Stanley says. I love this quote. He says, people nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. Think about that. And Jesus liked people who were nothing like him. This is who Jesus was and is. It's easy, I think, for us to like people who are like us, who share the same moral code and beliefs that we do, but Jesus is showing us a different way. By reaching across moral, political, religious divides, it's going to get messy. Not everyone likes it that way. Because Mark continues, when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw Jesus eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? You know, the people who didn't like the mess were actually the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day. In many ways, they did all the right things. They followed all the rules. They were good religious people, but they had a significant heart issue. They lacked compassion for people who weren't like them. They didn't have a heart for people who were far from God. Let me ask you, how's your compassion for people who aren't like you these days? How's your heart for people who are far from God? See, these Pharisees and religious leaders also didn't seem to grasp that they were sinners just like everyone else. When Jesus heard them talking this way, he told them, you know, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous and healthy and good, but those who just know they are sinners. You know, Jesus came for the mess. He came for those who will admit that they're sick. But the problem is we, we don't like to admit we're sick, and we certainly don't want to be around other sick people. I'm a bit of a hypochondriac, obsessive about not getting sick, really, and I hate getting the flu. I understand no one enjoys getting the flu, but several winters ago, I decided I was not going to get the stomach flu no matter what. So that entire fall and winter, I carried around hand sanitizer wherever I went. I washed my hands constantly. I took Airborne for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And before I agreed to hang out with someone or not, I generally had to ask whether they'd had the flu or not in the last week or so. Now, does this sound obsessive and weird? Everyone nod their heads. Yes, it is. Anyways, we were in Seattle over that Christmas visiting my family, who a week earlier 
had a bug that had passed around their house, but we thought we were in, their, we thought we were in the clear. A few days into the trip, we were on our way to a Seattle Seahawks game when something just did not quite feel right, and not because we were on our way to a Seattle Seahawks game, okay? But when we got to the game, took our seats in 40-degree weather, I just could not get warm. Not that it was that cold. I just, and so I bought a blanket. I, I bought some hand warmers. I stood under every heater that I could find in the stadium when I realized I'm getting sick. And I went back to my family and said, I'm getting sick. We need to leave the game. Of course, they knew they were dealing with a hypochondriac. So Emily looked at me like she'd look at her little baby boy and was like, are you sure you're getting sick, John? Like, yes, I'm getting sick, all right? So we walked out of the stadium, hopped on the bus that was taking us back to our car where we had parked when I knew I couldn't hold it in any longer. And while on that bus stuffed full of Seattle Seahawks fans, I ended up puking, and not quietly either. I vaguely remember people yelling at me, have another drink, why don't you? And my dad yelling back, he has the flu which ironically made people even more upset because now they're trapped in this enclosed capsule with the flu bug in the air and no place to go. It's disaster. <laughs> the point is, I thought if I did all the right things and kept my distance from other sick people, well, then, then I'd be fine. Spiritually, I think we tend to think the same thing. Again, let's keep the good, the righteous, the worthy over there, the unrighteous the unworthy, the bad over there, and never mix. It'll just be cleaner, easier, less messy that way. I mean, without raising any hands, do you know anyone like that? People who tend to keep their distance from people who fall outside of their standards? Here's the thing. If we're ever gonna reach people who are far from God, we have to go where they go, hang where they hang, and sometimes that's gonna create a mess. And it might even make us a little sick. So I thought of some ways that we could just practically embrace the mess in this next week. Maybe it's getting to know other parents at your child's sporting events, as simple as that. Maybe it's just to be kind to people you interact with on a daily basis, maybe at the coffee shop or the grocery store, rather than just brushing by, having a conversation. Maybe it's inviting someone to have a conversation with that you disagree with morally or politically. Now, I'm not wired to do any of that naturally. So I know it's gonna take intentionality and effort, but Jesus showed us it's possible to embrace the mess of another person's life while still maintaining our own beliefs, convictions, and moral standards. Remember, people, nothing like Jesus won't like Jesus until they like us and we like them. So embrace the mess because we're all a little sick anyways. Second way to help other people follow Christ, deal with your issues first. Now, we all got issues, but Jesus gives us a clear order of how we should deal with those issues. He says, why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own. He says, first, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Now we all have issues, like I said. But the problem is we're too often quick to point out the problems with everyone else before dealing with our own. You know, I've been married for almost 11 years, but in the first couple years of dating in our marriage, I would say that I was pretty critical and judgmental. There were seasons early on in our relationship where I found something wrong with just about anything that Emily did. Now, maybe she did a lot of wrong things, or maybe I was just judgmental. I think in our relationship, we landed on the, the latter, that I was too judgmental. <laughs> but one afternoon, I was lecturing her about something she had done wrong according to my you know, perfect standards. And after I finished, I was expecting her to apologize. She let me talk and talk and talk. And then when I was done, uh, instead of apologizing, she looked me square in the eyes and said, you have a huge glob of mayonnaise on your face. <laughs> and then she turned and walked away. To this day, we still use that joke whenever we're fighting about something done. But when we point out 
what's wrong with someone else before acknowledging our own, that's when we get labeled as hypocritical and judgmental. Not because we have mayonnaise on our face, not because we have a huge log coming out of our own eyes, but because we refuse to deal with that issue first. Now, to be clear, there is still a time and a place to make moral judgments about sin. Jesus isn't saying we just validate everything in fear of being called judgmental. Instead, he's saying, deal with your marriage first. Deal with your own pride first. Deal with your own selfishness and greed and sin first. And then, if we're ever gonna be given permission to lovingly confront another person's sin, we must be willing to deal with our issues first. And then, let's talk about someone else's problems. Okay, third and final way to help other people follow Christ is to join the party. Now, let me explain. If you spent any time in the church, you probably know the story of the prodigal son. It's about the youngest child, the one who got everything he wanted, the one that you all hate. And I say you all because I'm a youngest child, and it was glorious. <laughs> I think when you're the youngest, your parents are tired of trying as hard. You know, there's just more freedom, more allowance, more gifts, less pressure, no curfew. They don't even wait up until you get home. It's great. I mean, it's, and all the youngest are like, amen, that's exactly right. But this story is about the youngest son who got his share of his inheritance. And he takes the inheritance, he, he runs off with it, he parties hard and wastes all of his money living wild and free. And, and eventually the money runs out and he's starving. And so he comes to his senses and thinks, well, maybe my father will, will take me back. He realizes that he's a mess and his only hope is returning home. So Jesus continues in this story, he says, while this youngest son was still a long way off, returning back home. His father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. This is one of the most profound scenes and stories in all of scripture. This reflects the father's heart for all of his children. And the youngest son says, Father, please forgive me. I'm not worthy, and the father says, enough. And he turns to some people and says, go get the finest clothes that I have to put them on him. Go kill the best calf we got, because tonight we're celebrating. Why? For this son of mine was dead and is now alive. He was lost, but now is found. So the party began. Jesus wants you to know that no matter how far you've run, no matter how broken you might feel, no matter how much you feel like you've squandered and lost, when you return back home, God will welcome you home with a celebration and a party, not with shame and guilt. And many of you know that because that's your story. You were once the prodigal son or daughter, but now you've come back home. And now you have a relationship with God that guides and directs your life with wisdom and purpose and meaning. You were the prodigal, but now you're home. That's the story of the prodigal son. But see, this story that Jesus tells, it's not just about one son. It's about two sons. Because the oldest son, the responsible one, the one who did all the right things, followed all the rules, always obeyed his parents. The oldest son came home from working in the fields and here's this celebration and party going on. And so someone tells him, your younger brother came home and so we're celebrating. But instead of joining the party, older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. And maybe you're thinking, maybe he has a right to be angry. I mean, how would I respond if that happened? But see, he refused to join the party because this is where that attitude comes in of how dare that person be here. The keep your distance 
the morally superior, self-righteous attitude. He refused to join the party, so his father came out and begged him to join in. And the older son says, all these years, I've done everything right. You've never once thrown me a party. And now this brother of mine, this son of yours, comes back. He's squandered everything on prostitutes. He's lost it all, and you throw him a party. And his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed with me, and everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate this happy day. And the story ends. The older brother refused ultimately to join the party. And when I realized that, that just wrecked me. He refused to join in the party. Whenever we're invited to a party ourselves, Emily and I, Emily's first reaction is to always say yes. She wants to be at every party every gathering. She wants to be around the action all the time. She's a seven in the Enneagram scale, if you know that at all. She just, and maybe you're married to someone like that, but I'm the opposite of whatever that is, okay? I don't, I don't know what that is, but I'm the opposite. See, my first reaction whenever we're invited to something is to think of a reason to say no. <laughs> One time, Emily invited some of my friends over for my birthday party when one of my best friends, Charlie, said to the entire group of people there, he said, you know, the best gift that we could give John is for us to all be out of here by 8 p.m. <laughs> and he's right. It's, listen, it's not that I don't love people. I, I do. I really, truly love being around people. But my first instinct is to stay away from the party because it's just easier for me. But here's what I've learned over the years. Whenever I do say yes and show up, I almost always have a great time, and it's always worth it. The thing is, so many of you are saying no to God or to the church is because your instinct is just to stay away from it all. And I want to speak to both groups of people again, to those who have kept your distance because of the hurts or the wounds you've experienced from other Christians. I know it's easier to keep your distance to remain skeptical and bitter, to stay on the outside. But I'm telling you, God wants you to come back home. Be a part of what God is doing. Come back into a relationship with him. And to the second group, to those who stay on the outside because your preferences aren't getting met. You're not getting fed like you think you should be because you refuse to embrace the messiness of what it takes to reach people who are far from God, you are also missing out. It's easier to lob criticisms from a distance, and people leave the church all the time because of some sort of criticism they have towards it. And sometimes those criticisms are fair, but let me tell you, it's so much more life-giving to be a part of what God is doing through his church. God wants every single person to be in a relationship with him. There is no person too righteous. There is no person too morally superior. There is no person too far broken and gone. God wants every person at the party. There's a time and a place to call out sin and truth, and we're always gonna put a stake in the ground for that Christ-centered truth. But I'm telling you, that message will never be heard if those people first don't hear that they belong and they're accepted and that God loves them. If we're ever gonna reach people who are far from Christ, those people have to like us. <laughs> and we have to like them. They have to like coming to our church. Don, who's one of our pastors at the Anoka campus, several years ago, experienced this kind of welcoming embrace as an outsider, and it really changed her life. And so a couple weeks ago, she actually shared her story with the Anoka campus, and so I want everyone to see just how God met her through this church. Take a look. Well, hey everyone, welcome to Eagle Rug Church. My name is Don Wickland, and I'm a pastor here at the Anoka campus. I just wanna take a moment to share with you why Easter services have a special place in my heart. 
Because you see, 14 years ago, I found myself 19 years old, pregnant, and unmarried. And despite the struggles that my boyfriend and I were going through at the time, we decided to get married. And four months later, our son Caden was born. Now, if being a new mom and a new wife wasn't already hard enough, I received a phone call that would shatter my world. My 17-year-old brother, Jesse, who was my absolute best friend, and I couldn't imagine doing life without, had been killed by a drunk driver on my very first Mother's Day in 2006. 2008 rolled around and we welcomed our son Carter into our family, and I would love to say that life was getting better, but it wasn't. A struggling marriage, two young boys, and a deep, deep sadness I just couldn't seem to shake. 2010 rolled around, and surprise, baby number three, our daughter Rylin, was on her way. But a couple months before she was born, my dad, the rock of my family, sat me down to tell me that he had just been diagnosed with stage four liver cancer, and it didn't look good. I remember telling my dad, Dad, no, it's gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay, Dad, because that can't happen to our family twice. Four months after my daughter was born, I watched my dad take his final breath. I was so angry at God. I was 25 years old with a failing marriage, a failing mom of three young kids. I lost my brother, I lost my dad, I spent many nights on our bathroom floor begging God to just take me home because I didn't want to be here anymore. And then I received this invite from a distant family friend saying, Don, you should come check out this church called Eagle Brook this Easter. Everything in me wanted to say no. But I figured, what do I got to lose? I bawled from the time the music started until the closing prayer. And that was eight years ago this Easter. You guys, in the last eight years, God has restored my marriage. He has made me a much, much healthier mom of three beautiful kids and a pastor of all things. (laughs) Crazy, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. I kind of get choked up every time I see her tell that story because that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. That's the church that we are a part of. And maybe today you, you feel like Don once did. Broken. Hurting, skeptical. Maybe you've got some anger or shame and guilt, whatever it is. And you've been on the run for a really long time. If you hear nothing else, hear God say to you, turn around, come back home. God will welcome you with open arms and a compassionate, loving embrace. Come back home. Or maybe today, you're like me and you're thinking of a friend, a family member, a neighbor who might just be one invitation away from saying yes to watching online, coming to church, or giving God a chance again. And if we're gonna reach that person, we gotta, we gotta embrace the mess of another person's life. We gotta deal with our issues first. Be self-aware, look inward. And we gotta invite that person to join the party. See, I wanna be a church. I want your homes. I want your workplaces. I want our lives to be a place where people feel welcomed and accepted like Don because it changed her life. That's the kind of church that I wanna be a part of. And I know that you do too. I know that. With that, across all campuses, let's stand for closing prayer.
God, I know there's people here watching online who've been on the run for a really long time. And I get it. There's all kind of reasons to be on the run. God, I pray for those people that they would hear loud and clear that you're ready for them to return back home. That no matter how much they feel like they've squandered and lost, God, let them know it's safe to come back home into a relationship with you. God, I pray that as a church, we would be the kind of church that would let people know that they are loved and embraced and accepted. God, and that that embrace would allow your message to get through. God, because it's not about this church. It's about what you can do, the transforming in power that you have through a relationship with your son, Jesus. I pray that that message would be the primary message that every single person hears when they step through the doors of our church. I pray for all of our homes and our lives and our encounters with other people. God, for me, make me more aware of the people around me to engage in their lives, to build relationships with them, to get to know other people so that, God, people might see you through it all. And on this Memorial Weekend, I do pray for the people who have defended our freedom and have lost their lives as a result, God. Pray for those families and those friends, and, and I thank you for their humble service. And I pray for everyone who is involved in the armed services in some capacity, God, for the way they put themselves in danger to protect our freedom, God. Bless them. For those watching online overseas, God, we pray a special prayer of protection over them in gratitude and humility. And then for all of us, as we go about our lives, help us to reflect that gratitude in all that we do and all of our relationships and conversations, God. I'm so humbled to be a part of this church and grateful. And pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you'd like prayer, we have a prayer team down front. This is a great weekend to grab some extra prayer. See you next weekend.